Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the latest of Investex Focus Talks, a series of candid discussions with leaders, innovators and change makers. I'm Philip Shaw, I'm Investex Chief Economist in London, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by one of the most foremost economists, not just in the UK, uh, but the world as well. John Kay, good morning. Hi, uh, good to be with you. John, um, many people will be familiar with your byline from your, your long-standing column in the Financial Times, but you know, I have to say, my first encounter with your material was um, from your book on the British tax system from the late 1970s. It was one of our textbooks when I first studied economics at university quite a few years ago now. I think it's now on its fifth edition. When you co-authored it with, with Mervyn King those years ago, who became governor of the Bank of England, did you have any idea at all it would become so successful? Um, interesting you ask that. It was actually the second book I'd written or co-written with another author. And the first one was a very academic limited sale book. And I was convinced that this one would do a great deal better. And we took it to the publisher of the first book, who was um, willing to publish it, but was slightly sniffy about it, saying a book called The British Tax System is not going to rush off the shelves. And I remember writing to him saying that um, we actually thought this book was going to sell very well indeed. And uh, we went to another publisher and it did do pretty well indeed. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, it went through five editions before both Mervyn and I found ourselves busy with other things. But I remember the comment card on that I most enjoyed came in from someone who was a professor of physics somewhere. And he said, I've no idea how I got this book. I must have ticked a wrong box somewhere. But I enjoyed it so much, I want to keep it. That's, that's fantastic. But yeah. you've actually authored a, a, a huge number of books. And um, I think one of your most recent is one which you co-wrote with Paul Collier, published in July this year, uh, called Greed is Dead. And that's the polar opposite of Gordon Gecko's Greed is Good mantra. And in yeah. it, you, you talk about the, the, the benefit of cooperation, collaboration for society as a whole. How realistic do you think this objective is, given you know, what we can see as widespread populism in politics, not just in developed countries, but in emerging market countries as well, the numerous divisions which are present in many societies, and, and also the sheer pace of change taking place in the corporate universe? Yeah. Um, well, we certainly can't say that greed is dead. In that sense, the title is misleading. Uh, in fact, the first sentence of the book, I think, says we live in a society saturated by selfishness. Uh, what we want to, what we argue in the book is that intellectually, you know, that idea is dead, uh, that we've lived through, well, it's a nice 50 years from September 1970, when Milton Friedman wrote, the social responsibility of business is to maximize its profits. And we argue both that that era is coming to an end and that it should. And certainly when I, when I learned microeconomics, that the foundation of, of much of it is that individuals and, and indeed firms all act in their best interests. Do you think there's a, a good case for changing the emphasis on the way that we teach microeconomics at university level? Absolutely, very much so. I mean, one of the things that um, actually both Mervyn and I learnt when we went out a bit into the real world from the first 20 years as mainstream academics, really, um, was that uh, most people around, either in firms or in their personal lives, weren't actually maximising anything. And it had been used to uh, write, write preparing the models that economists typically use in microeconomics and the way you're describing, that's a bit of a shock. But it's a shock that I think a lot of people in the profession have not yet experienced. The idea that, you know, greed is, is dead and we're, we're focusing on, on a new model is, is a desirable ideal. Do you think it's achievable? And, and, and if it is, who leads it? Is, is it governments? Is it the corporate sector? I, th I think it really has to be the corporate sector itself. Um, if we think of some of the things that have happened in the financial sector over the, over the last 20 years, or one takes an industry like pharmaceuticals, which historically is really one of the great post-war successes of business, you know, finding drugs that um, transform people's lives. 
and at the same time selling them rather profitably. And that, that's been a great story, but it ended in the last decade uh, with price gouging by various firms and in the worst aspect of it, the sale of opoids to people who shouldn't have been, who became hooked on them and shouldn't have been taking them at all. I wonder, you know, what were the people who thought it was okay to do that kind of thing thinking? We need to change that. And looking at the, the world we're facing at this particular juncture, how successful do you think economic policies have been in, in buttressing various economies around the world in, in the face of the coronavirus pandemic? And, you know, when do you consider the appropriate point to unwind them? And how big do you think the challenges are going to be in doing so? I... Well, we just don't know what is happening to this virus. And one of the things I find very depressing about this is how poor the information base and the science base actually um, actually claims to be. We hear governments saying our policies are governed by the science, but it's not at all clear what the science is. And as I say, the information base we have is very poor. How many people actually have this virus? How infectious is it? How many people are being infected by it? Uh, and, um, you know, what is going on? Nor do we know what the seasonality of this particular virus is. So we don't know how, how much as winter approaches that is going to enhance or perhaps reduce the spread. We just don't know. And we can't make sensible economic policies uh, if we don't have... A, as it were, the information base in order to do it. I think one of the great lessons which economists have to teach people is the costs of obtaining information are very small relative to the costs of bad decisions based on poor information. And I think there's been a lot of that in the last year. I must admit one of my first initial reactions when the pandemic came over to Europe was, well, you have to, number one, know how good your data is. Uh, you've got to have more data and you've got to know how good your models are as well. Is, is that something you would agree with? Completely. And epidemiological models are very useful, but they're only as good. Firstly, they do, they're, they're not useful for making predictions. What they are useful for, and this is a general lesson for economists as well, is drawing attention to the parameters which you need to know or estimate in order to try and decide what you what you should do and it was a great pity that it took us something like three months to get round to the the random testing of people by the ONS which is the best indicator we have of how prevalent the virus actually is we didn't have that information when people were making their first decisions about the virus and we're not making that much use of it now actually uh, so we need models, but the purpose of models is not to enable you to predict what will happen in this kind of context. It's to, to enable you to determine the kinds of things that might happen and the information you need in order to try and manage it. Since the pandemic struck, arguably one of the big successes has been the ability of a lot of people to work from home rather than collaborating in the office. Do you not think that this is a step away from the communitarianism which you speak about in your latest book? And if so, is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's interesting. We, we've discovered that people like us can do a lot of their work, most of their work at home. And that obviously is prompting people to, to rethink the whole business of um, uh, community offices and communities. But the community issue for me is key. A central argument, and I agreed is dead, is that actually effective organisations work as communities of place and people. And while we can work effectively from home, many businesses of the kinds we're talking about, people businesses, have been able to operate very effectively over Zoom and the like. But actually that's possible in large part because people actually got to know each other in real life before the pandemic started. It's very hard to believe you can ever construct an organization of people who uh, only know each other virtually. Indeed, when we see the social media issues and problems we have, 
we can see all the negatives of people who only know each other virtually. Yes, there certainly are benefits, perhaps intangible benefits of face-to-face, aren't there, despite um, the benefits from from new technology such as Zoom. Looking at policy issues, um, and in particular fiscal policy, a number of people are saying and have claimed for quite a few years uh, that so-called fiscal orthodoxy is dead. And this school of thought claims that interest rates are low and central banks can buy government bonds. Of course, so many have over the past few months um, conducting quantitative easing. Therefore, uh, governments can simply borrow as much as they need without considering you know, metrics such as the size of deficits and, and outstanding debt. Um, things that you and I will, will always cherish as being very important. So what, have you, what are your views on, on, on this alternative approach? Well, I think in a country like Britain or most of the developed countries around the world, governments are a long way short of the borrowing being at levels where markets start to worry that they might default. But that doesn't mean there isn't a limit somewhere. And uh, if you... Um, if you want to see refute the idea that uh, governments can print as much money as they need to finance uh, whatever they want to do, you can look at the success of these policies in countries like Venezuela and Zimbabwe. And I think at that point you think again. You know, there's something in the argument that at current interest rates, it's not terrible to run large levels of debt for some time, but that doesn't mean you can do it Uh, in any quantity or for an indefinite time. And certainly in that respect, you you don't have to go quite as far as Venezuela or or Zimbabwe along that line of thinking to to look at the Greek crisis from early 2010 onwards uh, as as a warning when when Greece was unable to finance itself. (coughs) Numerous other countries had to be bailed out, which put Italy and and, and Spain and and, and indeed the um, existence of the euro area at risk as well. Yeah, and the fiscal orthodoxy is not complete nonsense, uh, but uh, you disregard it at your peril. Yeah, it, it, it's not a problem until it is a problem, I exactly. guess, in that respect, yeah. <laughs> uh, you were um, an early staffer, if I can call, call you that, at the UK Institute for Fiscal Studies in the late 1970s, and then you became its second director. And the IFS is is one of, if not the most respected independent think tank in Britain. Do you think that the role of the IFS has become more important over the past decade or so since the global financial crisis? And has its role been mirrored anywhere in the wider world? The idea of having a think tank that is ferociously independent, that has no political alignment, um, was something that was very difficult to put across and establish uh, at the end, I, I remember people when when I said we, we don't have a political lo- alignment, people would say, "Oh, you mean you're liberal Democrats?" <laughs> that really wasn't it. So there's there's also, I think, much greater need for independence because one of the things that um, I found remarkable thinking back is when we started producing various analyses in the early 1980s persuading people that our figures were as good as government figures was quite hard work. Today, I think, nobody would take government figures seriously if there were IFS figures available. On the one hand, the reputation for independence has been developed and strengthened. And on the other, people, I'm afraid, for good reason, have lost confidence um, in the accuracy and integrity of a lot of what is said by government. You've um, recently, again, published another book uh, with Mervyn King. I think it's over 40 years after the first one. Uh, This one's called Radical Uncertainty, Decision-Making Beyond the Numbers. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? What motivated you to write it and and how you found collaborating with with Mervyn King once again after so long? As I was describing earlier, both of us discovered when we went out into a wider world that people didn't really optimise things. And uh, I remember starting by thinking if they weren't maximizing profits and utility, what were they maximizing? And one day the scales dropped from my eyes and I realized that people weren't maximizing anything. They were trying to find solutions to issues, whether in their personal lives or in business, that were good enough. Uh, 
And that prompted me to think about the ways in which people use models. And we have, in economics, adopted an approach to thinking about uncertainty, which assumes you can attach probabilities to more or less every conceivable event. And that choice under uncertainty framework has dominated economics for 50 years, and it's the basis of almost all that is done in finance theory and a great deal of what is done in modern macroeconomics. And it's that, it, that is simply not how people either could or do think about uncertainty. So what prompted the book was thinking through what are the ways in which we people really both do and should think about uncertainty, and that's what the book Radical Uncertainty is about. In a sense, uh, the COVID crisis illustrates this very well. Rather amusingly, or perhaps amusingly is the wrong word, we do say in the book quite early, we must expect to be, uh, attach, uh, to be attacked by a pandemic from a virus which does not yet exist. We didn't know when we wrote that, but within three months or so, it would actually exist. But this is something that you can say, this is a likely event. But uh, if you ask the question, what is the probability it will break out in China in December 2019? You can't attach. That's not a sensible question. So do you think under these circumstances, um, that economists and you know, stock pickers, investment professionals, should change their, their approach to decision making? Is, is that something we can apply more widely? Yeah, I think that's right. That at the moment we have a pretense of knowledge in finance and microeconomics, which doesn't exist and which couldn't exist. So what we need to do and what we advocate is thinking about strategies that are much, much more robust and resilient to futures that you can't effectively predict. And that's a lesson that is, um, uh, that, that's a lesson that is quite easy to um, take from the COVID crisis. We saw so many systems that actually aren't robust to what happened, as well as some that, some that are. Having said um, the future is very difficult to predict, I'm ask, going to ask you to predict the future now. Um, ask you about your thoughts about the shape of... <laughs> Always the, do. <laughs> the, the, the global recovery, how, how, what does the shape of the global recovery look like in in the world over the next couple of years and i think perhaps more importantly do you view there to be a dominant dynamic in, in driving things forward um for example and we've looked at a need to diversify logistics and reduce reliance on on china for cheap goods are there any any influences like that which, which stand out to you i hope the lesson which people will take away which is a central lesson of radical of the book radical uncertainty is the need for robustness and resilience in strategies and the ways in which we, these are developed. We talk about uh, modularity and redundancy as being important to, um, uh, to help deal with this. And if you look especially at the financial sector, you realize that over the last 20, 30 years, we've regarded modularity as undesirable that is, we've tried to break down the barriers between different kinds of finance and redundancy as a sign of inefficiency. So I hope the a principal lesson that people will take away and a new dynamic is the need to think about strategies and market positioning in these kind of terms. One of your roles until recently has, has been as, as a non-exec to the Scottish Mortgage Trust, Investment Trust. Um, SMT has been one of the largest shareholders in Tesla, I think outside the Musk family anyway, uh, when investors or many investors have been screaming and they still are screaming about the overvaluation of the stock. What do you think in a broad sense about the future of electric cars, batteries, autonomous vehicles? Um, do you think investors specifically, I guess, but do you think they take too narrow a view over the, the, the sort of company that Tesla is? And, how on earth do you value um, such companies that are, are potentially so earth shattering and, and, and game changing? I think if you go back to what I've been saying, there isn't a way of arriving at the right valuation of Tesla, as it were. 
but one of the things that certainly has influenced the Scottish mortgage investment philosophy a lot is the realization of how much of the share, how, how much of shareholder value taken as a whole comes from a relatively small number of stocks. And that points you to long-term investment as a matter of trying to work out not necessarily what these stocks are, but what, the, what, what these stocks could be, companies that might become the General Motors or the Exxon Mobiles of the future. And that is, in essentially, is the argument for looking at Tesla. And Tesla, firstly, the, the future of, of cars almost certainly is electric. How fast that happens and who are the people who turn out to be the dominant players in it is a much more open question. But what is also important, I think, is Tesla's, um, te Tesla's position in batteries. Because um, if one gets serious about climate change, and people talk endlessly about climate change, I find, without being serious about it, a lot of what needs to happen is improvements in the ability to store and transmit electricity. And greater capacity to do that is the other really important side of Tesla's business. Indeed. So I think looking at investment principles more widely, would you begin to move away from you know, traditional metrics of valuations, such as, for example, price earnings ratios um, and, and complicated quantitative models and, and you know, move towards a more heuristic way of looking at valuations? I think that's right. People, there's not enough realization, both in the business world and the investment world, of how the nature of the corporation has changed. That um, the archetypal company of the 20th century was, as it were, General Motors. And you could write that down as a production function of capital and labor. You could see what the capital was in terms of the car plants they had around the world. Uh, and uh, you could substitute capital for labor in kind of ways economists think about. And other people talked about the firm as a, as a kind of nexus of contracts, an agreement between individuals who contracted with a company. If, if I'm looking at um, Apple or Amazon or the companies that have huge market caps today, they really don't look like that at all. If I go down the Amazon balance sheet, if I go down the balance sheet of either Amazon or Apple, for example, I found that apart from the cash they have, which they've accumulated because they're very profitable businesses, apart from the cash they have, they don't own anything at all. And that, that's a very different kind of business. It's not described by in terms of assets. Indeed, I, I rather wish we'd stop, stop talking using the term capitalism because capitalism, capital, is not what these people are about <laughs> anymore. Uh, that's very true. Certainly one of the big shifts that we're looking at in, in the corporate and, and indeed the financial world is um, greater emphasis on environmental, social, corporate governance, i.e. ESG matters. Do you have any insights on how ESG becomes a more important part of corporate and financial strategies and obviously at government level legislation as well? You know, I think a lot of the ESG agenda is very superficial. Um, I was talking earlier about what has happened in financial services and, uh, and pharmaceuticals, where you have really terrible corporate behaviour. And what socially responsible business to means, means to me is people not doing that kind of thing. What I fear has... Um, has happened. Well, it was epitomized for me when it was just before ICI finally died back in 2007. And I, I delivered a talk about the decline of ICI from what was for much of the 20th century Britain's leading industrial company to its final disappearance in 2007. And I got a pained letter the following week from the Vice President for Corporate Social Responsibility at ICI that said, we roughly paraphrased, we may have screwed up the business, but we did a great job on corporate social responsibility. And I thought, that is, you have really not understood what corporate social responsibility means. It is not about uh, brochures printed on recycled paper, which show uh, 
pictures of happy ethnic minority and disabled people. That's that's extremely superficial idea of what the social responsibility of business is about. But it's actually suited quite a lot of people because it keeps um, it keeps activists quiet while not affecting the business very much. Um, we have to get beyond that, I think. Yeah. And I guess one could argue that one offshoot of the old ICI, which in my time was Britain's biggest company, um, that it's part of it has morphed into AstraZeneca, which of course has a massive role in, in terms of developing vaccine in, in vaccines, including the, the Oxford coronavirus vaccine. So, does, yes. <laughs> so that's, that's certainly moved forward. Yeah. No, right. And ph pharmaceuticals is, is as a great example of both the best and the worst in business. John, you've, you've put it that developed economies are in a better position to deliver fiscal stimulus to help their economies to recover. Some calls from the World Bank to um, investors to forgive debt in emerging markets. Do you think that there is a case for doing that at all? We start with the issue of developed economies versus emerging economies. I'd go back to the argument I presented earlier about robustness and resilience. That is, if you conduct relatively prudent fiscal and monetary policies in normal times, you're in a much better position to deal with abnormal times. And that really is, I think, a, one of the many lessons of this particular crisis. Um, as for debt forgiveness, well, I think that has to be a selective story. It's country by country and issue by issue and much almost everything about emerging markets really and emerging countries depends on whether they actually have the institutional structures that are needed to enable them to use financial instruments effectively and some do and some don't and we it's not very difficult to point to examples of that but the development, in a sense, for me, is fundamentally about institution building. One of the features of the global economy, even before the, the pandemic struck earlier this year, um, was tension between the US and China and trade barriers being put up between the two, resulting in, in some slowdown in, in world trade uh, for a couple of years. Uh, do you see that as a recurring feature? Uh, of the ge geopolitical landscape over the next few years? This is a, a huge question, much of which is not really economic, because we have a new geopolitical situation, which is potentially very unstable, and trade is part of that. But I think we've, I think all of us have lived in a particularly benign political environment. For, um, uh, for the last 40, 50 years. Well, there's almost no period of human history where we, uh, there has been so, such an absence of major geopolitical conflict uh, as there has been during our lifetimes. And I think we all of us are, have to ask ourselves the question, were we just very lucky or can we actually turn this into a, a, a permanent state of affairs? And for the latter, it's not looking too promising at the moment with the, uh, the rise of populism and various other forms of aggressive nationalism and polarization around the world. Last question, and this is a, um, if you like, quite a random question. Um, you, you've had a number of years of experience as an economist in, in many fields. Bearing in mind, we've got this very interlinked world Different disciplines use different, similar skills, but with various experiences. Do, do you see a role for economists to share their knowledge in other fields and, and vice versa? Other experts being brought into economics? And I guess that's a rather long-winded way of saying, would we live in a more efficient and a better world if we all pooled our skills and our experiences? I think we would. And one of the things that has happened to me in the last few years is I feel most of what I've learned about economics, I've learned from people who are not writing about economics. And uh, I think what we are gradually developing is a social science which is rooted in 
evolutionary biology and psychology and the like. So that, and I hope that will take economists away from imposing normative models on how they ought to behave uh, to actually observing how people do behave and why they behave in these kind of ways. We economists have had a picture of rationality for the last half century that says, roughly speaking, if the world isn't like our model, then there's something wrong with the world and it needs to be reframed in accordance with our models. I, I think that's an approach uh, which I hope we will start to get away from. John, thank you very much. You've covered an awful lot of ground there and it's been an absolutely fascinating, very insightful interview. Thank you very much and we look forward to the next dozen or so books. Thank you very much. Very good to talk to you.